watching the world burn, watching the world burn. October 26th, 2024. Let's get into it. The uh, couple of big stories. You know, I always try to hit you up with the stories that, you know, you're not hearing anything about. And uh, I thought this was, because uh, I didn't know. You know, if you want to find out what happened at Bricks, there are lots of uh, X uh, posts, you know, uh, multi-threads uh, that talk about, you know, the deals, the number of countries, you know, everything you want to know. то за процветание наших народов, за укрепление нашего взаимодействия, за здоровье всех присутствующих. Спасибо. Наи сваруп ме БРИКС ВИСВАКИ 40 प्रतिशत मानवता और लगभग 30 प्रतिशत अर्थव्यवस्था का प्रतिनिधित्व करता है पिछले लगभग दो दशकों में ब्रिक्स ने अनेक उपलब्धियां हासिल की है मुझे विश्वास है कि आने वाले समय में यह संगठन वैश्विक चुनौतियों का सामना करने के लिए और अधिक प्रभावी माध्यम बन करके उभरेगा भारत ब्रिक्स के अंतर्गत सहयोग बढ़ाने के लिए पूरी तरह से प्रतिबद्ध है हमारी विविधता और मल्टीपोलरिटी में हमारा दृढ़ विश्वास हमारी ताकत है हमारी यही ताकत और मानवता में साझा विश्वास हमारी भावी पीढ़ी के समृद्ध और सशक्त भविष्य को सार्थक रूप देने में सहयोग होगा हमारा मानना है कि भारत और चीन के संबंधों का महत्व केवल हमारे लोगों के लिए ही नहीं लेकिन वैश्विक शांति स्थिरता और प्रगति के लिए भी हमारे संबंध बहुत अहम है म्यूचुअल ट्रस्ट म्यूचुअल रिस्पेक्ट और म्यूचुअल सेंसिटिविटी हमारे संबंधों का आधार बने रहना चाहिए Our story as the BRICS countries is a story of solidarity, of mutual respect and mutual benefit. BRICS is an inclusive formation that has the ability to change the trajectory of the global south. To do this, we must realize the full potential of our economic partnership to ensure sustainable development for all and not just for some. But one thing you didn't know was that they have decided they're gonna develop their own gold and silver or precious metals exchange. Okay, you know, right now, if you didn't know, precious metals are traded, paper trades through the COMEX and the LBMA out of London. Okay, and uh, it's very questionable how much they actually have in supplies because people have been standing for delivery. And from what I understand, some of those deliveries, the uh, metals came in, they weren't as pure as they thought they were going to be. So I do think those exchanges are gonna go bye-bye. You know, the, the way that works is uh, you got one ounce of gold, you might have a thousand paper contracts for that one ounce of gold. And that's how the, uh, the West I'll say the West, you know, uh, the United States to, to you know, the World, uh, World Bank. That's how they keep the price of precious metals so low. Well, you know, when you have another exchange, and by the way, you know, you've got the Shanghai Gold Exchange already, so I imagine they're going to kind of 
merge the two, so it's not going to take that long. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if that exchange was up and running within a year or so, because you can already trade on the Shanghai Gold Exchange. So, you know, maybe they're just going to combine the two. I don't know the details, but I do know this. Once the price of gold, silver, platinum, palladium get priced at a fair value, whoo, you want to talk about skyrocketing. <laughs> I mean, the, the dollar's going to be, uh, uh, you know, imagine a Ferrari against a Volkswagen Beetle. <laughs> and the BRICS uh, gold exchange is going to be the Ferrari, and that's what the dollar's going to look like. They're going to put that dollar in the rear view mirror. I can guarantee that. Plus, they'll put those uh, the Comex and the LBMA in the rear view mirror also. So that is a, it's a huge, huge story that you probably haven't heard anything about. I haven't seen any other people on X talking about it. But to me, that you know, that was one of the biggest developments. I mean, we could talk about BRICS just a little bit. I mean, good Lord, you want to talk about a successful conference. I mean, I don't even know how many countries were there. If I can get that number, I'll put it up above in this video. But you know, one, one little factoid that you probably didn't know is the World, uh, World Bank, or the WTF, has uh, revalued you know, the economies of the world. So you've got uh, the United States, China, India, and Russia is now the fourth largest economy in the world. So think about that. That's three out of four of the world economies, India, Russia, and China, that are leading the BRICS. And you know, the only other economy that's not a part of BRICS is the United States, we're all alone. You know, and there's no other economy even close to these four. So, you know, it's uh, this whole BRICS thing is a big, 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 big deal. And I've been trying to make videos and warn people, but I don't think a lot of people knew about the gold part of it. So uh, we'll move on to the next story and see, try to cover the stories that you don't hear anything about up front here. And that is the, uh, oh, by the way, price of silver, once again, between 33, 34, SD Bullion had a sale for $1.99 on two ounce silver coins, but they sold out. Not a good sign, uh, but they do still have the um, Canadian Maple Leafs. I think it's $2.49 over spot. So you're looking at about $37, I guess, per, per ounce to pick up some coins if you want to. I mean, I mean that's a high price. I, like I said, I can't do it. I, I don't have the, the, the wherewithal I'm paying. And that's another thing I hope, you know, if, you, if you're like me, I'm just paying down debt as fast as I can. Keep, don't be going on vacation. Don't be buying a new house. Don't go, be going out buying a new car unless you have to. You know, we got to have reliable transportation. But, you know, then pick you up a good used, uh, hopefully not a, you know, not a fixer upper, but maybe you can work out something with a local garage. Have them inspect it. You know, if it's only, if you pick it up for $3,000 and it takes $1,000 to fix it up to where it's, you know, somewhat reliable, there you go, $4,000. You're in a new a vehicle. You know, until, until prices come down, you're going to see the, the auto market crash. You know, how cars are selling, what is it they said that a damn truck costs these days? I think like an F-150 was between 70 and $80,000. That's a freaking house, man. Who the hell can afford to buy a truck for that? But trust me, the price of those vehicles is going to come way down. Plus I wouldn't, unless you need a truck to haul around, you got to be looking at a gas sipper instead of a gas guzzler. And on that note, the title of this video is going to be Israel blinked. I was upset. I didn't get much sleep last night because I was trying to follow along on what was taking place with the bombing of, of Iran. And uh, I thought for sure, I said, well, this is it, man. This is the world war. The Democrats got their wish. This is the October surprise. I put up a couple of posts about it. Uh, mainly I was pointing people to a song. Uh, I think it's called, uh, I can't remember the name of the song. It, the joke is on me, I think is the name of the song. It was done by the Bee Gees. And then also there was an, another band that the Bee Gees stole it from. And back in, uh, I think it was, I want to say, was it 96? Anyway, it was many years ago that they did the song. It's really a great song. Uh, if you want to listen to that song, it's on my X feed. So uh, where was I? I was talking about the uh, gold, silver. Oh, the, uh, the story was Ezra Blinked. Okay, so. My understanding was it was 100 planes that were involved, okay? That's, uh, and then, you know, of course, the United States is saying, 
we weren't involved in any way, shape, or fashion, which is a bold-faced lie. We, I'm sure we gave the Israelis a lot of satellite information and intel. Uh, and I ha I'm not, I haven't heard anything, but I can't believe that, you know, that's a thousand miles those planes had to fly. They had to have refueling. And I don't know what the Israeli refueling capabilities are, to be honest. But I thought that they would have to use uh, American uh, refueling to be able to fly that distance. So I'm not so sure that there weren't American planes. Not, not in, in the actual attack, probably. I, I think they're being honest about that. But I don't think they're being honest about the fact that we didn't have fuel tankers flying alongside. Now, what targets, the reason why I say Israel blinked, what targets did they hit? Well, the huge concern for me was if they hit the nuclear facilities and the, uh, the oil, uh, you know, the oil production, because Iran already said that if that happens, they were gonna take out all the oil in the Middle East and, and shut down the Strait of Hormuz and then just launch everything at Israel. And I mean, that, that's the end of the world right there. <laughs> I mean, just about, you know. You say, oh, well, that's all taking place over in the Middle East. Well, no, you know, I have a feeling it would have pulled in. Cause you know, there's so many war hawks in the United States that blindly support Israel and everything that they do, uh, that uh, I do feel that we would have gotten dragged into that regional conflict. And then also, uh, I, you know, Russia's got a huge investment in Iran right now. They're certainly given, and by the way, that was another thing, was the, uh, the air defenses evidently did pretty damn good in Iran. There was, uh, and that was the other thing I was, I was getting to it. They restricted the strikes to military targets, which is a legitimate target, you know? Because uh, if, if the argument can be made that Israel is supporting the uh, proxy wars, you know, against Israel with the Houthis and uh, uh, Hamas, maybe to a certain extent, and then of course in Yemen, you know, uh, the uh, the Houthis there, and uh, I'm sorry, Hezbollah. That's the third. So you know, th that's a legitimate hit. Do I expect Iran to respond? There's war hawks in Iran calling for it, no doubt about it. I don't think they will. It's not in their best interest. They just got off of bricks. Okay, their economy is now firing on fault all cylinders because they've got trading partners now outside of the sanctions because you know not not the west because we got sanctions on them and they would why disrupt that why poke you know poke the bear so to speak uh israel you know when now two people died don't get me wrong this this was they, and also from what i understand they took out a uh, an anti-aircraft uh, s300 battery so it wasn't like this didn't hurt iran you know Anytime people die from bombs hitting the ground, you know, that's a big deal. I mean, think about World War I, Archduke Ferdinand. One dude getting killed started the whole damn war. I mean, of course, there was many other things that did it, but I mean, that was supposedly the final catalyst. Anyway, that's everything I wanted you to know, but the beauty here is, is I think we're done. I don't believe at this point, uh, unless something changes, that we're gonna have a regional war in the Middle East. And that's why I say Israel blinked. I don't think Iran's gonna strike back. I mean, this is all good news. I, was, I wasn't even gonna do a watching the world burn video today because I was so happy about, you know, that, that the world, at least at this point in time, is not gonna explode in a nuclear holocaust, you know? So anyway, that's, that's good news, right? So uh, that's everything that I think you need to know about the, the, the event. Now on, the, on a different front, Israel's still bogged down in Gaza. Now, the, um, the, I want to say it was the UN. They just put out a study because in northern Gaza right now, you know, the people are starving to death. And they're, they're guessing uh, within a month, maybe less, that most everybody in northern Gaza will be dead. So the Israelis have accomplished their goal of, uh, of not only destroying the infrastructure, but they also accomplished their goal of killing everybody. And that should make a lot of Christians happy in the United States because they you know, they support Israel and everything they do. So, uh, so that's about, I would say, you know, we're getting upwards of about 60% of the Palestinians in Gaza will be dead shortly. So, uh, and, and why is that good for the people that support Israel? I support Israel. I want Israel to survive. I don't want a genocidal maniac, you know, uh, country to survive. I think there's a lot of good people in Israel just like there's good people in the United States. But uh, this, uh, this murderous rampage that they're on, I'm against it, 100%. You can take that to the bank. But the, you know, the, so I wanted to give you the good news for Israel 
because you know every time you kill a family you know there was a video 13 kids died one bomb whole families dead or the only person that survived was the, the the woman you know imagine you had 13 kids and your husband all dead and she was uh, she was wailing in that video the other big story that came out of Gaza was the uh, and this is you know this is part of the extermination uh, campaign was they uh, raided a hospital or the last hospital and uh, they took all the doctors out of the hospital and relocated them supposedly relocated I'm not so sure that they probably didn't line them up and you know like the Germans did and just shoot them all and just you know bulldoze them into a ditch but uh, I, you know, I, I have no, no proof of that whatsoever. Don't ever think that, that I can prove that. I, 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 but I do know they did gather them up and they took them out of the hospital. So there is no uh, medical care in Gaza, per se, for the Palestinians. So you know, why, why do I say this is good for the people that want the Palestinians all dead? Is that not, there will be no more fighters. You know, that's one thing. You know, if, if Israel went for a peace plan right now or a ceasefire... You, you, you don't think, after all the people they've killed and the families they've destroyed and the, the property damage that they've done, that there ain't gonna be a whole new batch of Hamas fighters that are out for blood? I mean, I, I, I would be. Somebody blew up my house, killed you know my dog or whatever. You know, back when I was married, my wife. Man, you wanna talk about, I'd be weaponing up and I'd be going after them. Well, you can't go after them if you're dead, right? So Israel, you know, by doing what they've done, they're going to eliminate that entire threat from Gaza because they're all going to be dead. So, you know, that's only 2.1 million people. Not a big deal, right? At least that's what the, the uh, Israeli, you know, Sean Hannity's of the world think. So the, uh, the, the other front was uh, Lebanon. I heard that Israel is going to pull out of Lebanon uh, within the next couple, three weeks because they are getting spanked. No doubt about it. Now they're doing some spanking, so I mean, you know, both sides, but Israel, you know, Israel's a small country, man. What is it, like the size of New Jersey or something? You know, they can't take the losses that they're taking, you know, and, and still losing people in Gaza. There was a tank that just got destroyed down there, you know, so the Hamas is not completely defeated. It's just once they've exterminated everybody there, you know, then the, they don't have to worry about Hamas no more. So that, that'll help the Israelis out. And, uh, and if they pull out of, uh, of, uh, of Lebanon, that could end the war altogether. Because no longer are they fighting Hamas because they're all dead. And, the, uh, and of course Hezbollah then has no reason to continue attacking Israel because there's nobody to defend, right? They're all dead. Just, uh, just giving you a different slant on that whole conflict. If you want a whole breakdown of everything, uh, Daniel Davis, I tell you what, he always does a good, good video. He did one, uh, you might want to check him out. Because uh, I, I watched him before I came out here, and that's how I, I got all the, the information that he, about the attack and every, everything else. And then, of course, uh, the gold part, that was the uh, economic ninja. Although, I tell you, I, had to, I went up and looked at his real estate course. I was going to think about signing up for it. To me, I don't know, maybe I just clicked on the wrong thing, but it was like $1,200. I ain't got $1,200 to learn how to buy and sell real estate. Plus, you know, I'm more into... You know, here's a here's a, an investment plan for you that I'm thinking about doing. Is uh, now silver? Yeah, right now, you know, 34. Let's say it hits 40, 50, you know, dollars an ounce. Well, what's wrong? Even at this point in time, of selling some of your silver, like I, you know, because I own it through the Sprott ETFs. That's the major portion of all my silver, gold, platinum, and palladium. But I'm thinking about selling because and those assets don't 
pay. That's why Warren Buffett never invested in gold and silver. I mean, because I'm not getting any interest. I'm not, you know, I'm not getting any dividends, so to speak. It's, it's not an income producing asset for me, other than the fact that it's protecting me against a dollar that's going to hell in the handbasket. You know, that's all that, that the only reason that I own all that. But I, I'm thinking about converting that silver over to mining stocks. Now, if I find some good deals on some mining stocks, if they haven't gone way up, I know they've gone up, uh, I'll let you know in either this video or a future video. But that's just an investment. That's not investment advice. That's just something I'm thinking about doing and I haven't even done yet. And I, I don't, don't even have a recommend for you, you know. So I got to look at all the prices. And, you know, like I said, there was a consolidation that took place. So I'm, I'm not sure how many, how many of those are left. The, uh, let's talk about Trump for just a minute. If I can find the video, I'm going to put it right here. He, he played it. He was just in a, 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 what do you call it? A, you know, where he does his rally. That's it. Dang on it. Couldn't find the word. Sorry. He did a rally up in Novi, uh, Michigan. And I was just tuned into it because sometimes I just like to listen to Trump. And uh, and then he, he actually had it up on the big screen, his new advertisement about, you know, a woke Democrat military versus a Trump uh, in unwoke military. Let's watch that now if I can find it. You little scumbag! I got your name! I got your ass! You will not laugh! You will not cry! You will learn by the number! Happy Pride! Happy Pride Month, and actually, let's declare it a summer of pride. So you're a killer! Sir, yes, sir! Let me see your war face! Sir, you got a war face? Minister of Death praying for war. But until that day, you are pukes. You are the lowest form of life on earth. You are not even human fucking beings. You are nothing but unorganized, grabastic pieces of amphibian shit. How to abracadabra these bitches know I got answers the way I... It looks to me like the best part of you ran down to crack your mama's ass and ended up as a brown stain on the mattress. Wasn't that great? <laughs> Hope I found it. Uh, the uh, the other story, reason why this is a watching the world burn video, because like I said, good news right there. I'm you know, giving you a lot of good news. Was Somalia? Somalia has gone uh, once again up in flames. I found this video on RT. You know, it speaks for itself. It's, it's not a full fledged, uh, you know, uh, all out battle or anything, but it is a, a place where people are dying. Let's watch that. The Rapid Support Forces continued their incursion and blockade campaigns on the 25th of October 2024, targeting a large number of villages. Dozens of civilians have been killed in the villages of al Sariha, 50 dead, 200 wounded, according to RRCS, Azraq, besieged, al Gnamab, 13 dead, in addition to the displacement of tens of thousands of villages east of the Gezira. Dozens of people have been killed and injured in a series of attacks by the Rapid Support Forces on villages in Al Jazeera State in Central Sudan. We understand that the attacks targeted the towns of Zuka, Maknun, and Tambo. The debt tour remains incomplete due to communication um, disruptions and the ongoing search for missing people. But the attacks are believed to be in retaliation for the defection, rather, of a senior RSF um, commander who has now joined the Sudanese army. His name is Abu Akla Kikal. And uh, 
Kikal's defection is the reason behind the waves of displacement that we're seeing now. Um, and uh, uh, because of his defection, the RSA fighters have been quite furious and went on a rampage. We also know that many people at this moment w w would say to us that this is not new, but it is new for the once calm region of Eastern Jazeera State, which has now been transformed into one of the most active battlegrounds in Sudan. And this war, which erupted in April of 2023 between the SAF and the RSF, has created one of the most acute crises in history, with more um, than 14 million people displaced. And as the conflict edges closer to full-scale civil war, international efforts to contain the violence have largely failed, leaving civilians to fend for themselves. The international community has been asked to step up its efforts since April last year, but nothing notable has been done. Turning to Sudan, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs is gravely concerned by the impact that ongoing armed conflict is having on civilians in many parts of the country. In North Darfur alone, the International Organization for Migration reports that in just six months, some 410,000 people have been displaced in the, local, in the locality of El Fasher. Many of them had already been displaced at least once over the course of this conflict. We continue to receive reports of civilian casualties and indiscriminate attacks impacting public infrastructure in residential areas, both in North Darfur and elsewhere, with many areas effectively cut off from humanitarian assistance. Now, these current attacks have forced even more residents of many villages to flee their homes. What is worse is that the looting by the RSF at the start of this attack has also left displaced destinations with severe cash shortages and widespread loss of personal funds. But that is not all. In the morning, even they attack us. And, you know, during they attack us, um, in the roads, they took us everything, money, food, clothes, and even they killed, you know, the relatives and the friends, you know. That was a difficult time because they, they did, you know, such horrible things. In our way to Adere, uh, we come, we find them also like dead bodies, they kill people, those whom were like coming to, uh, to kill people. So they were in the, ro in the road with motorbikes, with like guns and with cars. So they enter houses and they take uh, a lot of uh, uh, things that you have. From those voices, we get a sense that the Sudanese war is brutal. It is devastating and it shows no signs of coming to an end. Again, all previous attempts to integrate the two powerful militaries have not led to any success. We've heard the Sudanese armed forces repeatedly promising to fight until they have secured a military victory, an outcome that is far-fetched given the extent of the RSF's current military strength. Okay, so that was the video from RT, but uh, getting back on Trump for just a minute was, uh, you know, he just did that interview with Joe Rogan. Now, I haven't watched the whole thing. It's like three hours long. Imagine sitting down and having a three-hour conversation. And by the way, Joe Rogan He's a powder puff, man. He doesn't put you on the spot. He just wants to talk to you. You know, get feel things out and, and, you know, express his opinion on things. You know, whereas, you know, if you go on ABC, CBS, NBC, or any of the, uh, the left-wing uh, propaganda, government propaganda channels, you know, if Trump were to appear on there, he'd be attacked. Whereas with Rogan, it was just a nice sit down. But the thing that I, I think that really went in Trump's favor is, you know, the Democrats call Trump... Uh, Hitler, they've said that he's going to put all the blacks in concentration camps when he gets elected, which he didn't do the first term. I don't know why he would turn around and do it on his second term. At least the Democrats want you to think that. And then they also, they painted him as a, a threat to the democracy, right? He's a threat to democracy. He is Hitler incarnate. He's going to take us, uh, well, he did. I don't see how he could take us into any more wars than the Democrats have. <laughs> I mean, when you think about it, you know, they got us in war everywhere in the world. You know, Trump kept us out of war. So they, I, I don't think they can call him a warmonger. Uh, and I don't know how he, but anyway, the, it was just a really nice conversation. And I think that the independent takeaway from, from that, uh, I, I guess you could call it an interview, uh, but... I have a feeling independents are seeing Trump in a different light now. You know, they're seeing him as a human being. In fact, he seemed like a genuinely nice person throughout the, uh, the um, conversation. You know, it's kind of like just you sitting in a, in a bar or uh, maybe, you know, someplace, uh, you know, you're out 
for a hike, just having a conversation with someone. You know, you're looking at him going, you know, this guy doesn't feel like Hitler to me. You know, he, he, he seems like a genuinely nice person. I wonder if by everything the Democrats have been saying is wrong. And they're saying that it did give Trump a boost in the polls. Now, Kamala, she's refusing to meet with Joe Rogan, but she would do it for herself some good. Because like I said, he's a powder puff. He's just going to have a conversation with her. He's not going to put her on the spot. Although I imagine that he would talk about some things that would make her very uncomfortable because of her position, you know. Uh, so that was that was another story. Uh, it, anyway, I just thought that was pretty cool that Trump was there. By the way, look at them. Look at how this the old dude. That, of course, that's another thing the Democrats say he's old and decrepit. Well, geez, can you imagine doing two rallies? He did one in Novi, and then he flew to, flew to Pennsylvania. I don't know where in Pennsylvania. And he's doing a second rally in one day. And it is because of my love for our country, and specifically because of the leadership that President Trump has brought to transform the Republican Party and bring it back to the party of the people and the party of peace, that I'm proud to stand here with you today, President Trump, and announce that I'm joining the Republican Party. Two rallies in one day, that's, a, that's tough, man. Imagine, get, I mean, I don't know about you, when I get on a plane, it, back before I broke my neck, you know, and I get to my destination, the only thing I want to do is get in that hotel room and just, you know, maybe watch some TV, have some drinks, chill out for a while, I mean, the last thing I would want to do is get off the plane and do a rally <laughs> I mean, in front of thousands of people, you know. So don't tell me that dude ain't got some, he, he, he ain't buff, he's in shape, man, I'm telling you. And uh, plus the mental uh, activity, you know, you got to, if you're going to give a speech to 10,000 people or whatever, you got to be on the top of your game as far as being able to speak. You know, you got to keep it entertaining. You got to, you got to know your topics, you know. You, uh, of course, you know, I mean, I'm sure he's got the teleprompter helping him out. So that's it on on Trump. Uh, we'll get to the next topic here in a minute. We talked about Somalia. All right, let's just break off here and I'll think of the other things that I wanted to talk about. Yeah, getting back to the uh, the interview with Joe Rogan and Trump. Uh, I just wanted to give you some scenery here rather than my ugly mug for a bit. But uh, anyway, um, I thought there was some good uh, discussions that they had. The one was Trump would be uh, amiable to eliminating the income tax. Now, you know, that was a Democrat. I think it was Woodrow Wilson back in 1913, because the United States for a long period of time never had an income tax. In fact, I, I'm not so sure that there's actual writing in the Constitution that that is not supposed to be possible. And then uh, I think the conversation came up about Congress being able to, uh, you know, invest in the stock market to, to, you know, make themselves millionaires as they vote on the, uh, the policies that, that you know, the companies need to, to make more money. So it, uh, insider trading, more or less. You know, so that would be pretty cool if he enacted that. The other one that a lot of people are fussing about, but I wanted to give you my take on it. Let's get over here, look at that. There's the sun through the tree. Huh. See, I hear a bird. Anyway, was the uh, tariffs. And that's actually a pretty brilliant idea. You know, you, everybody says, well, the tariff is just a tax. It means that the price of goods are going to go up. Well, yeah, they are. You know, the price of goods out of uh, China, uh, other countries, price is going to go up. But what does that do? And, and that is a tax, okay? I, I, I'm in totally, a total agreement. But that makes American companies much more competitive, okay? And so a lot of that, those jobs and things would, you know, eventually come back to the United States, assuming, you know, we can, because we got a friendly government for hopefully the next four years, friendly to business, that is. And uh, so they, they, you know, businesses can count on the fact that those tariffs are going to be in place. In fact, the Biden administration left a lot of the Trump tariffs in place. So they never really uh, got rid of them. Uh, they, you know, they certainly, uh, have, boy, I haven't even talked about the border yet, have I? But uh, so I just think it's a, it's a, it's a good tax It'll replace the income tax because the government, you know, that's, that, you know, that's because there's no way, I mean, the country's bankrupt. The dollar's going down. You know, we're going to have hyperinflation. But, you know, in, 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 which means we're going to have to establish some sort of new system of uh, a monetary system. 
And so in that new monetary system, you're going to have to fund the government in some fashion. I would rather fund the government with tariffs that will bring, you know, and by the way, think of all those jobs that come back to the United States. Now, now you got the economy firing on all cylinders, so the government makes more money from the economy. They make money from tariffs. And you put more money in people's pockets by getting rid of the income tax. I think it's a brilliant plan. I don't know why the Democrats aren't for that, you know, other than, I don't know, their blind hatred of Trump or whatever. I, I guess Democrats just love to pay taxes. And same with open borders. I had my ex-wife in the car. She's a huge Kamala supporter. And, you know, we were having an argument about, I said, how can you be for all these illegals coming into the country? Oh, you know, it's just, that's all Trump propaganda, Trump propaganda. I said, no, it's not propaganda. How could you say it's propaganda? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, at least the people in Chicago and New York City, you know, they know that the illegals are there, or Springfield, Ohio. You know, there's been story after story. I mean, even, even the mainstream media has covered it to a certain extent. And getting on to illegal immigration, you know, that uh, I, I was talking, oh my God, I was talking to a friend of my mother's, you know, th these old people, they, they don't know where to get their news from. They just still watch the mainstream media, but, but she's still sharp as a tack. And I mean, we always have good conversations. But the thing that shocked me was she thinks that FEMA has done a good job helping the people in North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee. And I said, no, the, the federal government spent $600 million flying illegal aliens into the country. Mayorkas. Which, you know, that, that's another question that I, baffles me. How come the Pentagon and the military have allowed Mayorkas to run, or, or even, well, I mean, Congress is mostly Democrats, so I can understand it. But, I mean, how can you allow him to just keep committing treason? That is treason to bring, and especially spend the FEMA money. That's even more treasonous. So then uh, what the, there was a woman on, and she was talking about they can't even afford to buy the body bags, and nor have they found, they still haven't found all the dead people up there in the mountains. They're still digging up bodies. And FEMA, evidently, they said they're broke. They're not helping hardly at all. In fact, there, there was some sheriffs up there told FEMA to just get the F out of the way, you know, because there's no help whatsoever. And then FEMA came out, you know, they said they have no money because they spent it resettling you know, millions of, of illegal immigrants. How are the Democrats for that? I don't even understand it. And I, I imagine some of those people in those mountains, although mostly Republican, but there's probably some Democrats up there. I'd be pissed, man, if it was the Republicans that had spent all the FEMA money, uh, you know, on relocating and, and funding illegal immigration, flying them in. I mean, first, you know, think of it. I'm sure it wasn't first class, but I bet a bunch of them were first class. They certainly got, you know, meals and, and they're settling them into nice accommodations when they get here. <clears throat> you know, they're taking American jobs and the Democrats are all for that. It doesn't make sense to me. So that's where we came from. Isn't this beautiful? I was going to do a different trail today, but the fact it's kind of warm and there's no shade on that trail. So I came here instead. All right. I guess that's kind of the, the talking points. We'll, we'll do uh, a sit down here shortly and uh, go through the, the a couple of ex-posts that I found uh, interesting and that'll be it for today's video. Well this sucks, I got the new mic working but unfortunately with the protective case on the phone I can't use the new mic. <laughs> Although first part of the video it was with the new mic. Anyway let's just read a couple posts here. Uh, I'm gonna put this up, this is Trump, he's wearing the gold and black uh, well, I guess you could call it the dark MAGA hat that the Elon came out with. Uh, so uh, this is from Marjorie Taylor Greene Press. And uh, Trump's aura is unmatched. Kamala can't compete. Uh, anyway, I thought it is cute. It is cute. up the points that I was making. Uh, he says, Trump accomplished a lot with the Rogan interview. He admitted to some of his mistakes and clarified why he had lunatics like John Bolton on his staff. And you know, Bolton's a lunatic, just like Lindsey Graham is. And uh, But Trump said that when he would go into sit down with some foreign leaders, he'd have John Bolton there. And they're looking at Bolton going, we can't believe he's part of Trump's staff. <laughs> he's a warmonger, man. Oh yeah, so scared. He, was, he said it was good to scare the, uh, the, the the foreigners, which I thought was kind of kind of cute. 
Uh, he's quashed the ongoing left-wing narrative that uh, Trump is Hitler and that he is exhausted. We talked about that. Uh, he reached potential new voters, uh, new demographics uh, that might not have been uh, exposed to. He uh, dwarfed Kwamala's rally in Houston and uh, completely dominating the airways. By the way, at that rally, um, I'm not sure if it's the same rally, but Kamala was going to have Beyonce there. And a lot of the people, the left-wingers, showed up for the concert. And then she didn't do a concert. She just endorsed Kamala. Kamala. And so she was getting booed because <laughs> there was no concert. I thought, you know, at least Trump doesn't have to have a concert every time. Uh, he could prove he could do a three-hour interview off script, and uh, Kamala chickened out. Uh, he mended some bridges with the libertarian independent communities and came off as sincere. All in all, the move from Trump is already proven to be a massive success. So I, we talked about that. Uh, this was a, I, I'm gonna I put this video up. Uh, this is talk about being, the elite are so out of touch with the world in general, but Melinda Gates says mothers in uh, Bos Boswala, Africa, where there is no running water and nothing to eat, need smartphones to keep track of their children and make sure they are vaccinated. Other problems uh, soon to seem to be irrelevant for this. After all, the most important thing is vaccinations. <laughs> I mean, come on. And I can be an out in a remote rural village, you can be in Botswana, and a cell phone rings, even where there's no running water. So when a woman, I'll use that example, can see on her phone, the vaccines are available at the clinic. Today's the day I should walk with my kids. Today's the day that contraceptives are available at the clinic. Today's the day I should go in. A woman, what she mostly has in the developing world is her unpaid labor. But she doesn't want to use it to go into clinic if the vaccines aren't there. And yet she knows that life-saving vaccine will save her children's life. So that information is vitally and critical to her. It's critical to her in terms of her kids' safety, knowing if they go out where they are. I think those people are worried about where the food's coming from, don't you? I mean, you know, but that's just uh, that Gates, you know, I mean, he's, he, he pushed that vaccination on the whole world. You know, he wants us eating fake meat. You know, that guy, he's a, he's a lunatic, too. Uh, but he's an evil lunatic, an evil rich lunatic, unfortunately. Israeli Defense Forces, in response to months of continuous attacks from the regime of Iran against the state of Israel right now, the Israeli Defense Forces is conducting precise attacks on military targets, and we talked about that. Okay, that's it for the video. Peace out. Stay free. <laughs> Yeah, why you should hide the illa on Hayate?